Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Jim Cobray. I want to share a subject that's on my heart and talk with you tonight about this wonderful thing called the power of humility. I just can't get rid of it. I have four or five other messages rolling around on the inside of me, you know, and, and this, I, I don't know that a lot of people really understand the depth of humility. I, I just want to make it clear to you that in the definition that we've had in the past, which is, I think, easiest understood and clearly understood, is humility is not a low life existence. You know, like whoever it can be, you know, think low of themselves and think little of themselves and all that kind of stuff. And I, I, I think that's the wrong kind of Bible understanding of the word humility. Humility is someone who is amazingly and deeply committed and dependent on God. That we don't go anywhere, we don't do anything, we don't have anything, we don't say anything, we don't be anything without God. Deborah never prepared a message for Israel. She's in Israel for 10 days. In the last three days, she's preaching three times every day. How does that happen? It's God. It's just God. God comes out and she just ministers. And we're going to try to do a lot of things in life. You're going to try to build buildings. You're going to try to build your business. You're going to try to raise your children. You're going to work at your marriage. You're going to try to get a retirement program. You know, at the end of your life, you want to economically and spiritually be successful, certainly spiritually more than anything. But God wants to see you economically successful too in every area so that you can fund the gospel. The Bible makes it very clear that he has the power to get wealth that might establish his covenant in the Bible. It says in the book of Deuteronomy. And so all of us in here, there's a part of something that we overlook greatly in understanding who we are in Christ Jesus. You know, when you start to understand who you are in Christ Jesus, I'm the righteousness of God, like Pastor Luke preached this morning, phenomenal message. You know, I, I have two points about righteousness. This young generation comes up with five points about righteousness. They're, they're just so far beyond anything I could ever imagine. And uh, they're amazing, and I, I just take my hat off to this next generation. And I happen to think that Pastor Dan and Pastor Luke are just two of the best pa young pastors in America, to be honest with you. And I, I said there, my mouth open. I've, I know I've heard preachers all my life. Uh, I've been around the world with some of the greatest preachers in the world. They don't hold a candle to what these young men are bringing to this church. So I hope you appreciate that. It's just um, unbelievable, you know. There's no him hawing around. It's just facts, and it's just good. But one of the areas that we miss all the time is the area of humility. Sometimes we get good at what we're doing and we forget about where it came from. I, I, I heard this story just recently about um, a, a church that uh, saw a man in their congregation. They watched him for a number of months and even up to a point of a year and they said, man, that guy is the most humble, humble man in our church. And they all got together and they decided, let's honor him because he's so humble and let's give him a pin. And he can wear that pin, being the humblest guy in the church. So they humbled him. He was honored to have the pin. Came back next week wearing the pin. They had to take the pin away from him. You don't get it. And here's why we don't get it. Because as soon as you acknowledge that you're humble, you're no longer humble. And it needs to be something that comes from the inside of the heart. Let me explain it to you like this. Winston Churchill at the end of World War II during the war, he was noted as the Roaring Lion. That was kind of his nickname, the Roaring Lion. At the end, very humbly, he made a statement. He says, I'm really not a Roaring Lion. I'm just a man who was called to roar. And see, you and I are called to serve God. And all the praise and glory and honor goes to God. And may I say this to you? In 1 Corinthians, the last verse... It says that no man should glory in his presence. I mean, you're not going to take credit for anything. Everything we have, everything we do, everything we'll ever be yeah. is because we are called to the roar, but he's the lion. In other words, he's the power. He's the source behind all of this. And I don't know if you understand this or not. There's three areas that are very important for humility, this dependency and this expression that we put other people before ourselves. 
Of course, number one area is to God, but number two area is to others, and number three area is to ourselves. And really, it's important to be humble in yourself, that you understand who you are, where you came from, and never forget it no matter how much greatness that you're going to accomplish in your life. And then you have to be humble towards others where you take your life and you literally serve the others. That's what Jesus did. He didn't just come and lift himself up as the king of glory, which he could have done. Is that not true, saints? But he didn't. He came and he was the servant. He wasn't the master. He was the servant. And for all of us, we need to realize that God's looking for somebody with a humble heart that will not only understand it himself for himself, but also have this humble heart, if you will, that will serve others. And then, of course, a humble heart before God because he, this is what's so weird, he reads the recesses of your heart. And when he can tell where you're at, and sometimes, how many realize that you can you can not mean something in yourself. You don't think you're even doing it, but God sees the reason why you're doing it. And he can see the recesses of your heart. He knows the depths of your heart when it comes to humility. I want to make a statement. I think I'm going to prove it to you tonight by the scripture. You can't even really get saved without humility. There is really no conversion without humility. You probably never heard anybody ever say that to you. You must think, oh my goodness, this guy's gone nuts. That's the craziest thing I've heard. I just sang that song. Obviously, I believe in Jesus. Obviously, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Did you know the devil could sing that song too? He knows that too. Doesn't mean he's saved. It's fascinating when you stop and you start to look at the things of God and the word of the Lord. Uh, I find it exciting when we're able to open up the word of the Lord and take a look at some things. So tonight, I just thought what we'd like to do is I'd like to take a look at something there. I want to share with you the heart of men, if I may, in the area of humility. But first, I want to put up an expression that I, I used. I hope they have it ready in the back part. It's a little, little expression about humility. Humility is, is a issue of the heart that reveals the destiny of your future. And sometimes we don't realize how important humility is, but stop about, for a moment, stop about your, what you're doing and think about what I just said. Humility is not something you just do. Yeah, you do it to learn, but it's gotta be something that's an issue in the heart. And what it does is it will reveal the destiny of your future. In other words, your entire future with God is dependent on whether or not you're going to operate in the power of humility. There's this guy in the Bible, his name is King Saul. He was the first king of Israel. Israel is complaining that everybody else had a king. Their king was Jesus. Their king was the Lord himself, creator of the heavens and the earth. But they... They made a statement in the 8th chapter of 1 Samuel, one of the saddest chapters in Scripture. And the statement was, we don't want to be like ourselves. We want to be like everybody else. We want a king like all the other nations. We want a king that will protect us. We want a king that will fight for us. We want a king that will go out before us. And sadly enough, it was just such a slam on God and so disappointing. There was a prophet in the land, a great man of God. His name was Samuel. And Samuel really was a spiritual leader, if you will, of Israel at the particular time. You've heard the name Samuel before. And Samuel's so discouraged with the people that he gets frustrated. God says, why are you depressed? Why are you down? They're not talking about you. They're talking about me. They want to replace me with a man. He says to, he says to Samuel, go back and tell them, here's what's going to happen with the man that they select. I'll give them a king but he'll just steal from them, take their kids, take their vineyards, take their life, take their children, take their manservants, women servants, take everything. And the people make this statement that is the most bizarre statement in the world. After they hear the warning from God, they say, nevertheless, what a word. Nevertheless, we hear what you're saying. We don't care. We want a king. So God finds a humble man by the name of King Saul or Saul, as you know it. 
You know him as a guy that's taller than everybody else, a head taller than everybody else in all of Israel, really, really handsome. When God says this guy's handsome, you can imagine. When God says he's handsome, this would have been really handsome. Taller than everybody else, he was like, fits the perfect thing, you know. I'm, he just the perfect image of a hero for Israel. They're really thrilled about it. When they find him, he is so humble. He's humble towards the things of God. He's humble towards his father. He's humble towards other people. He is just a humble man. He even makes a statement, why would God choose me to be king over Israel? I'm the least of everybody in my tribe. Our tribe is the smallest. Our tribe has nothing. Just totally, I mean, totally out of himself, if you will. Just totally humble. And then you'll find that after he becomes king and starts to hear from God, and God starts to bless his hand, he starts to think greater of himself and starts to make decisions on his own without God. And that's the first sign that you have now gotten out of the will of God, gotten into a, your own path, and are not on the path of God is when you make decisions on your own to have your own direction, your own thing. You know, most people that attend American churches ask God this, God, here's what I want. Can you get involved in it? Will you get involved in it? God, here's what I want. Instead of praying to God saying, God, what is it that you want? I want to get involved in what you want. And immediately you'll find that that's a very... When you make that kind of a prayer, humility flies out of the window. You're no longer humble, and that's dangerous because now you're in a spot where it really could be trouble for your future. God's going to have a hard time blessing you. So all of a sudden, we find the words where Saul messes up so many times that God rejects him as king, and he goes to Saul through Samuel, and God speaks to him and says, I have already selected another king. Now, King David's going to follow him. King David is just a young man on the hills of Judea singing songs to his father's sheep. He has no idea that he has been seen by God and selected by God and God has already appointed him to be the king over Israel, the next king over Israel. And so Saul has to dismiss, if you will, excuse me, Samuel, Samuel, let's go back, has to dismiss Saul the king, and he tells Saul what was wrong with him. And I want to take you to 2 Samuel, if I may, and I want to put up the words as he describes it to 2 Samuel, and it's really a cool thing. In fact, I'm sorry, let's go to 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel, let's take a look at the 15th chapter. Here we find the prophet, the man of God, First. Uh, in 1 Samuel, Samuel speaking to Saul about literally firing him as king over Israel. And in 1 Samuel, let's take a look at verse number, if you will, uh, uh, chapter number 15, verse number 17. Samuel's talking to Saul and he makes this statement and it's written in the scripture for you and I to learn. Watch this. He says, so Samuel said, remember he's talking to Saul, King Saul. When you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? In other words, God did what he did because you were little in your own eyes. Not because you're a superstar. Not because you think you're wonderful. Not because you're full of pride. Not because you think you can win the battles without God. You can call it your way. And sometimes what happens with success, and here's the problem, God wants to cause you to be successful in every area. With success comes ruin because we never stay humble. All of a sudden we're good at something. Or all of a sudden our prayers start to get answered. All of a sudden there's more money in the, in the bank account than we've ever had before. Uh, wouldn't that be nice to experience? All of a sudden, there's, a, you know, the, the marriage is good. All of a sudden, the kids are starting to do good. All of a sudden, where you didn't have a house, you start to have a house. And all of a sudden, guess what? When you were small in your own eyes, God ministered to you and brought you these things. But now that you have all of these things, all of a sudden, we, what do we do? We stop and we don't forget it, but we forget about God. He says, when you were little in your own eyes... I mean, that is a bizarre statement. 
In other words, you're now big in your own eyes and you failed. And so for all of us, this word humility means something really important. In scripture, you'll find there's this guy by the name of Josiah. He was a, a good king over Judah. Judah was the two southern tribes of Israel. There's actually 10 northern tribes. They had never had a good king. And then there's two southern tribes of Israel, Benjamin and Judah. And the king that is born into this position as king, his name is Josiah. And you'll read about him, if you will, go with me into 2 Kings this time. And let's take a look in 2 Kings, the 22nd chapter. And something funny happens in the life of Josiah. First of all, let me read you verse number one and verse number two. I'll skip over the crazy names of his lineage. He's really part of the lineage of David, and that's what you need to know. But verse number one of the 22nd chapter of 2 Kings says this. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. Okay, verse number two. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand nor to the left. So this is a, if you will, like this morning, a good king over Israel. What happens in his life is someone finds the word of God. It had been lost, it had been put away, nobody had paid any attention to it. Israel was now worshiping false gods, doing things all on their own, anything but humble, just doing their own thing, worshiping their own ways, which oftentimes we find ourselves doing. I want it this way. I, it should be that way. And this is what I like. This is where I'm going instead of where does God want me to be? And we find him in this place where he finds the word of God. And he sends out, and this is kind of interesting, he says, I want the word of God translated. I want to find out what it means. Get me a prophet to find out there's some great prophets in town. Well-known people who have written in the Bible, great prophets. But he ends up with a prophetess, a woman. That ought to blow some of your theology right there. He bypasses a man and goes to a woman, and a woman interprets the word of God and reads the word of God. And when he hears the word of God on how much trouble Israel's in, remember, keep in mind that Judah now is a, a two tribes that he's the king over, and he realizes that they have not been doing the word of God at all, and they are in trouble. And he doesn't know what to do about getting them out of trouble. Because when he hears it, something happens on the inside. He's going, oh my goodness, we've been worshiping the wrong God. Oh my goodness, we're in trouble. God's going to curse us. We have trouble here. And notice what it says in 2 Kings 22 chapter. Go with me to verse number 11. And it says this in verse number 11. Now it happened that when the king heard the words of the book of the law, that he tore his clothes. Keep in mind these words, tore his clothes. A lot of times we don't understand what that means. We just read through the scripture and really don't understand what tearing his clothes meant. Tearing his clothes meant a humble expression. You see, the clothes described what a man was, described his incomplete identity. His clothes described his wealth, his status, and his position. And all of a sudden, he's the king and he's wearing kingly robes. And he finds himself in the place where he heard the word of the Lord and he comes to this place and says, man, we have cursed ourselves because we're not doing anything that the word of God says and we have problems and I don't know what to do with it and I'm the king and look at my robes and he starts tearing his robes apart. Because what he's saying is my identity, my value, my position is not important What's important is the things of God. And can I tell you something? Until all of us get to the place, I don't care who you are, how many times you go to church, I don't care how much water's been sprinkled on you and incense has been thrown on you, until you and I get to the place where we are at this place where we're ready to take ourselves off and put on God, I doubt if you're even saved. And it's so important for us to see this as part of Christianity 101. 
He tears his clothes. Let's take a look at a little bit deeper. The same character, same guy, Josiah. Go with me to verse number 19 right there in the 22nd chapter. It says this, because your heart was tender. Now stop right there. When I saw the word tender, it means flexible. It means pliable. The other day we were at a funeral and I saw this little girl and she was just crying and crying and crying. And then she came up to me and she grabbed me and she cried and cried. I bet she cried 15, 20 minutes on me. And then I started crying. And she just cried and cried and cried. And you know why she was crying? She didn't care what anybody thought. She didn't care what she looked like. She didn't care about whether she had, was cool or whether she had status or had anything. She was just tender. And so tender that the pain of the moment had gotten to her. She was hurting on the inside. And here you see that this is not just something he does. It's not just some routine he goes through. It's not just because someone said this is the way you ought to act. But this is a real expression from the depths of his heart. It's an issue that's coming out from the inside and he has a tender heart. Can I say something about each and every one of you? You would not be here if you did not have a tender heart for God. Stop it. You'd be in a bar, you'd be watching television, you'd be staying home, you'd make excuses. You're here on a Sunday night. Do you know why? I don't care what anybody says about you. You have great potential because you do have a tender heart or you would not be here. Come on, somebody. <laughs> he says, because, here's God speaking. He says, uh, he says, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord. And you humbled yourself before the Lord. You humbled yourself before the Lord. God, it's not me. It's your word. It's your way. It's your will that's important. God, we're being cursed. Oh, my goodness. I humbled yourself. How did he humble himself? He tore who he was away, his identity. And for some of us that are in here tonight, you're going to have to tear your identity out down in order for God to build up who you really are in Christ Jesus. Is anybody listening? He says, when he heard what I spoke against this place and against the inhabitants. Go to the next part, please. He says, that would become a desolation and a curse. And you tore your clothes and wept before me. I also heard you, says the Lord. In other words, he got into a place. Some of you need healing tonight. Some of you need God to come through in your business tonight. Some of you need just the joy of the Lord restored to you like you used to have before. Some of you are in your marriages are in trouble. Some of you are in here, you don't know where you're going, don't have a purpose, don't have a destiny. You know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to humble yourself. You're going to have to tear off who you are and put him on. You're going to have to get before him with a tender heart that you already have and make the expressions to him and God will come through for you. But he's listening to these words. He says, he says, I also heard you, says the Lord. Why? Because he spoke in a humble manner to the Lord. I think you and I, we are called to know without a shadow of a doubt we are king's kids. But that's a roar of who I am, only an expression of his grace and mercy. I'm blessed in the city and blessed in the field and blessed coming and blessed going. And everything I put my hand to, I shall prosper. But guess what? That's just the roar of the lion because all of that comes from the lion. Come on, somebody. Without an understanding of that, what we do is we roar in who we are instead of roaring in who he is. And you define this and you miss it completely. And you wonder why the blessings of the Lord aren't coming through. It's not about who you are. It's about who he is inside of you and me. Without that, boy, we truly miss it. There's this guy named David. God, I, I, David so impresses me. You know him. In the bloodline of Jesus is David. And in his bloodline, there's all kinds of people, even Josiah, the king that we just read. But David is called from the hills of Judea there. He was pastoring, if you would, or shepherding sheep. No big deal. Just his father is very wealthy. Singing songs to the Lord, fighting off the wild animals so his dad could keep his sheep. God catches, he catches the eye of God in his worship and in his praise. And God sees him on the hills of Judea 
and says, that one, I can sense his heart is tender and humble before me. He'll be the king. Saul never had the humble heart except when he started. And the riches perverted and his fame perverted and his wealth perverted and his ego perverted his future. And you and I, as God blesses us, need to always remember that this is not about us, our ability. We've already shown our ability before we got saved. Do you remember those days? Do you remember waking up wondering where you were, what you did? Do you remember the shame of how you lived? You laughed with your friends about it, but deep down inside you were ashamed person on the inside for what you did the night before, the week before, the month before. You hated yourself for it. That's where we are by ourselves, but with God, all the shame is gone and all the sin is gone and it's washed away with God. And therefore, sometimes when we get back into a position where we're feeling pretty good about ourselves, we forget where it all came from. And that's when humility, and that's what happened with Saul, but David was different. God wasn't going to allow David just to go right to the top. He kills, if you remember, Goliath. He could have immediately become king right then and there. Oh no, God's got a training system for him. And years he's running for his life. And at times he's even doubting what Samuel anointed him to be king over Israel. And he's even doubting whether or not he's really going to be king. He runs even back to the Philistines and he starts to even make a camp in Goliath's hometown and pretends like he's crazy so they don't kill him. Oh my goodness, this guy is a low Lifer. He's gone all the way down. But you know, sometimes people have to go all the way down to see which way is really up. And so for some of you tonight, God's taking you to a place so you can see what's up. Because we miss it all the time. David's at that place. He's finally anointed king. I'm talking maybe 15, 18, 20 years later from the time Saul pronounced that he anointed him with oil to be king. I mean, if you anointed me to be oiled by God, to be king through a prophet like Saul, I would run down to Anaheim Stadium, have great meetings, have T-shirts with my fit picture on them and sell my CDs for $500 each. But not these guys. This guy has a years of training, getting himself out and getting God in. And finally, he's into Jerusalem. In fact, the city is called the city of David. It's Jerusalem. That's where Deborah's at right now is as we're talking tonight. And he brings the ark in, the ark of the covenant, uh, ark of God, not the ark of the covenant, that was a movie. The ark of God has been found and is brought into Jerusalem. It was a difficult situation to get him there and cost people their lives because they did it the wrong way. David backed everything up and started doing it the right way and got the ark in the city of David, Jerusalem. And when he does, he is so excited of the fulfillment of God that he starts to dance and sing and shout. He starts to tear his clothes and he starts to make a scene. I mean, he is anything but a king. He doesn't look like a king. He's just a wild man excited because he doesn't care about his position. He cares about God's position that God is back in the city of David in Jerusalem. I want to take you, if I may, into 2 Samuel, the 6th chapter. You're right there in 2 Kings. Just go towards the front of your Bible, the 2 Samuel, the 6th chapter. And let's take a look at some things that are interesting. We're talking about humility tonight and the expressions of humility in our lives. In Samuel, the 6th chapter, it says these words. <clears throat> In verse number 13, and so it was that when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces and sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep, David danced before, verse 14, David danced before the Lord with all of his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought the ark up uh, of the Lord with a shouting with a sound of trumpets. And now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, now here's his wife, Michal, Michal Saul's daughter, who's David's wife, 
looked through the window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord. She despised him in her heart. You know why she despised him in her heart? Two reasons. One, other women saw him. Secondly, he didn't act like a king. David has a comment about that. She confronts him and tells him what a fool he looks like. And he makes this statement to her, and I love the statement, verse 22 of the sixth chapter of 2 Samuel. I will be even more undignified than this and will be humble in my own sight. Sometimes you just have to be who you really, really are. For some of us that are in here, we allow ourselves to be moved by people. We live what people think. We live about, we care about what people say. You know, that's a form of humility that is perverted. And we need to do what we really are, who we are in Christ Jesus. Listen to this because we're saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. I will be even more undignified than this, he says to his wife, and I will be humble in my own sight. And as for those maidservants and who you had spoken by, by them, I will be held in honor. She thought they were after it. She thought they exposed his body as he danced to them. She thought he should have acted like a king. This is not about what you act like. It's about who's on the inside of you. It's not about who sees you. It's about who's on the inside of you. It's about you making the decision to keep yourself humble. One of the worst things we could ever do is ask God to humble ourselves. God, please, in your prayer, humble me. I know it's important. You do not want God to humble you. All through the scripture, you'll find that the God hears those people who humble themselves. It's a really important point. For an example, Paul, writer of the New Testament, brings the dispensation of grace. No one else has ever preached the grace message like Paul. Lived it. On the road to Damascus, God's doing great, mighty, marvelous things. He's reaching the world. Today, he's written, read by more people than anybody else on the planet every single day. Who would ever think of such a thing? And yet, Paul writes these words in his humble position to Timothy in 1 Timothy, the first chapter. Will you go there with me? In 1 Timothy, the first chapter, listen to what Paul writes. An amazing account of his life. He could have said about anything, but he didn't. He could have said, I am special. I've been great and done wonderful, magnificent things that nobody will ever do again, which we have never seen to the likes of in the church to this day. <clears throat> but Paul writes this in 1 Timothy. I'm just getting there. First chapter, in verse number 15, he writes these words. This is the faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. We can all say amen to that. But here's the part that gets me, of whom I am chief. Paul knew the power of humility. I've done great things. People absolutely are amazed by who you are and what you're doing, Paul. But Paul sees himself as the chief of all sinners. A couple of weeks back, I, you know, being the senior pastor of this church, a lot of people say things and do things and have crazy, suspicious um, uh, superstitious ideas about me. And they say crazy things. I was walking through the courtyard. There was about 5,000 people in the courtyard for one of our Sunday night parties. Remember our birthday party? And Debbie and I made one tour all the way to the back and all the way through. We, we never get to celebrate a party because we're just so inundated with people. God bless them. They, it's wonderful. And I guess they love it. And they kept coming up and taking pictures. I bet I had my picture taken with Deborah at least 500 times. And this one lady comes up to me and she says, in fact, there was two of them that night. How much does it cost to have my picture taken with you? And I thought, oh, precious. Oh, my goodness. Where are we in the church that someone would be so irreverent to God to think that he built this place? To think that he could play the people and take money for having their, his picture taken. Oh my goodness, God forgive us in the church 
that people would think such things. I have to tell you, after I took the picture with I said, Precious, I should, I, I should pay you to take my picture. And then I thought, I wonder how much money I could make tonight. <laughs> I got rid of that real quick. It was just part of my old nature and flesh. My point being is this, saints of God, is that you know when there's a lot of attention coming towards you, you've got to reflect that to your head and your head is Jesus. So when the statement comes along and says, let it go to your head, let it go to your head. It goes to Jesus. A woman caught me at the back door not too long ago. She says, are you James Stephen Gobray? And I thought, oh my goodness, someone's gonna serve me papers or something, what is this, you know? I said, yes, I am. She says, I can't believe that I'm looking at you. And I said, okay. I'm right here, people look at me all the time. She says, you built this place. I said, no, I didn't. I just followed God. To tell you the truth, if I had to build it, it wouldn't be here. Because I had no money, I had nothing but a word from God to build the house of God. And he would supply as we went. She says, it's not true. You built this and you need the credit for it. And And I'm thinking, man, this woman's got a demon on her. And trying to get me out of the position of humility, of reflecting that right back to God. Are you, are you following me? And, I, and if that was you in here and you still think that, you need to repent. This is about God. And it's always going to be about God. Jesus makes a statement, the most bizarre statement a lot of people don't understand in Matthew, the 18th chapter. Go with me to Matthew, in the 18th chapter. Let's take a look at, speaking of humility, we're going to go quick and finish up. But Jesus makes this statement in the 18th chapter of Matthew that is a shocking statement. In verse number of the 18th chapter, verse number, let's go to verse number, well, I'll, I'll, I'll read you verse number two. I don't think it's on the overhead, but I'll read you verse number two, and then we'll go to verse three and four. And it says, And Jesus called the little children to him and set him in front of the midst of them, speaking of his disciples. Watch this. Verse number three. And said, Assuredly, I say unto you, and unless you are converted and become, unless you are converted and become, unless you are be- converted and become, wait a minute. I thought the only thing God cares about is conversion. Unless you be converted, along with conversion is a position and become as little children, you will by no means, even if you're converted, and wait a minute, you can get mad at me if you want, I didn't say this, guys. This is Jesus. Now, Jesus just lumped conversion into humility. Because a little child is like, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. I'll just follow you. I'm attached to you. I'm, I'm submissive to you. Without you, I don't make it. Without you, I don't exist. I don't know how to feed myself. I don't know how to get that money. I don't know how to get rest. I don't know how to be comfortable. I don't know how to be warm. I don't know how to. A little child is dependent on an adult. For existence. And he says these words, which shocked me when you start to read it. I say unto you, unless you are converted, we stop at conversion, but we never go here. And become as a little child or children, you will by no means enter, unless you become like a little child, by no means you will, unless you become like a little child, didn't say anything about just being converted. In other words, There's no way anybody's getting saved unless they're humble. Because it takes something to give God all of your heart and all of your life. You can sing that song that we sang earlier tonight. Oh God, I believe in the Father. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the conversion. I believe in the Holy Church. I believe in the rapture. I believe in whatever. But I'm here to tell you something. My Bible says that you can believe that with your head and still not get saved. Because the Bible says in Romans, you must believe unto righteousness. Are you ready to operate in righteousness in the ways of God? And can I make a statement to you? You will never want to operate in righteousness in the ways of God as long as you're on the driver's seat. You've got to get off the driver's seat and put him in there, and that's called humility. And that's what he says here, until you become like little children. But listen to verse number four. Verse four, it really describes it. Therefore, you know the word therefore is therefore what he just said, 
right? I've taught you that for years. The word, every time you read your Bible, you see the word therefore. It's therefore because of the last sentence he just made. Becoming like little children, you'll not enter into the heaven, the kingdom of God. Therefore, whoever humbles himself, humbles who? Humbles himself. Humbles who? Humbles, oh God, humble me. Oh no, you don't want that. I don't know, I don't think God will humble you, but if he did humble you, can you imagine the ways he could humble you really easy? Huh? Oh God, he says, humble yourself as a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The greatest in the kingdom of heaven is anybody that gets saved, even better than John the Baptist, according to Jesus. <laughs> Talk about humility, how important it is. Sometimes we overlook this, don't realize that everything we have, we got from God. Everything we'll ever say, everything. Jesus even operated that way. He says, when you see me, you see the... What did he do? He took a different position of the Father. He didn't say, when you see me, you see everything. This is all there is. He says, when you see me, you see who? The Father. Jesus comes along to the Holy Spirit. He says, I must leave so that the Comforter may come. I don't know. I found great comfort in Jesus, but Jesus says, Holy Spirit's going to be great comfort. All of a sudden, there's a difference. There's a hum humble, and he's our example as we come along and see these things. And he says these words. He says, conversion without humility is no conversion at all. Because conversion that says I'm still on the throne of life, I'm still my own boss, I'll do it my way, guess what? You won't make it. Because God reads not just the words that you speak and your mind thoughts, but he reads your life and what you do. That speaks louder than your words. So Jesus makes a statement. John, James says this in, in James, kind of an interesting verse to go along with it. James is the half-brother of Jesus, the pastor of the church of Jerusalem. Man, can you imagine being the half-brother of Jesus, pastor of the great church of Jerusalem? Oh, my goodness sakes. Now, that's a man who understands how to be full of pride. No, listen to what he says in the fourth chapter. Pop it up in the fourth chapter, verse number 10. He says, humble yourself. Man, you got to always remember what you have and what you're going to get and who you got it from and who gave it to you. And this is really about the truth. The truth is, man, this is about God. You can come pat me on the back all you want, but the bottom reason, the only thing that's good about me is I'm a follower of God. And in following God, you become successful. And people see your success as if you did it. When in truth is I am successful unbelievably successful but the truth is I'm successful because I just simply said God I'm too stupid to do anything else but follow you that's the truth and I know you don't want to hear that that's why in all the churches we hire all the PhDs to be in the pulpit areas can I tell you something and half of them aren't even saved And you listen to the History Channel explain religion and Jesus Christ to you. You wonder who they're talking about, Mickey Mouse? Well, they've got so many doctorate's degrees, and guess what? They're not even saved. They have a clue who God is. It's like, flip it off, man. Because God says that there'll be no flesh glory in his presence. So you've got to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Then he lifts you up, and when you... Re now, this is... A the catch 22, when he lifts you up and you think you're lifted up, you're no longer humble. <laughs> that means you got to turn your pin in. <laughs> Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You got to turn your pin in. The guy had it one week. How crappy is that? You're the most humble. You put, there's a pin. Okay, I'll wear the pin. Wear the pin. Oh, you're not humble anymore. Let me have it back. The moment you see yourself as lifted up or better than someone else or you did it yourself, you're no longer humble and you're in trouble. Amen. Wow, powerful. It's just so interesting as we take a look at the word of the Lord. I'm gonna finish with Proverbs. Is that all right? Pop, pop up my Proverbs first. I'm finished. By humility and the fear of the Lord. Whew. Look, I, I'm standing before you tonight telling you the truth. The seats you're sitting in, 
the sound system you're listening to, the air conditioning you're experiencing, the salvations by hundreds of thousands of people at this church since its beginning. Hundreds of thousands. There's, there's, there's nobody going to make a statement like that in all the Inland Empire. There's probably very few people in the entire United States that makes that statement. And here's the truth. At the helm of this ship is a very dependent, weak-minded person who just simply says, I'm tender-hearted. If you say it, as much as it is against what I feel and think, I'll do it. Success, all of it comes by Jesus, by no one else. All praise and glory. At the end of your life, you're not taking one single thing with you. You were born naked, and when you die, you will take nothing with you except eternal life. And that's what this is all about, is a people who realize I was born naked and I will die. And everything they put in the box with me will rot to dust. But in my life, there's two things that are eternal in the scripture. Forever and ever and ever. The word of God and the soul of a man. Tonight, some of you need to Stop messing around with God. Stop just singing that silly song, which I'm going to put my foot down. We're not singing it anymore, this church. And the reason for it is because it leads you astray, thinking you're saved and right when you're not, because you haven't been humble enough to give your heart to the Lord. Someone said to me the other day at the back door, if God wants me, he'll just come and get me. Well, that's a humble position. Baloney. He went to the cross for you, I said to that lady. What more does he have to do? He humbled himself for you, became a man, to give you an example. Now the question is whether you'll humble yourself and get out of yourself and get in Jesus and really be converted like a little child, ready to follow him to righteousness. And somebody tonight loves you enough to tell you the truth even though you might get offended and get up and walk out. I'm too old to care. Won't be long before I stand before my Savior. And I want to hear, well done, good, faithful servant. Tonight, humility with conversion is important. And if you have maybe made the conversion statement, prayed the prayer, but you haven't followed up with it. Humility. Giving God all of your heart. Now I'm going to make you do something that's going to humble you. You're still holding on to yourself instead of holding on to God. You know who you are. Here's humility. Then get out of yourself and come and stand in front. That's what I'm saying. If you want to be saved and be converted, you're going to have to be like a little child that listens to the Father. You're going to have to get out of yourself and ready to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. And if you haven't yet done that, you're still into yourself, then tonight is your night. Get your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, if you need a friend. I'm not even going to say any more than that. I'm going to sit in my chair. I know there's people that need to come. You come, stand right here, and we'll lead you in a prayer. But if you're too prideful, that's what I'm trying to say to you tonight. You're saying, no, I'm too full of pride. 
to get up. Let him, let him get on his knees if he wants. And that's what keeps us out of the kingdom of God. I'm too prideful. It takes guts to get out of your seat and come up here. There's two, but the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and there's at least 15 of you that need to come. No. I said 15 because that's what I wanted. He said 22. I could see 15. It's hard for me to see 22. See, salvation isn't just conversion. It's conversion with humility. You don't have to get on your knees if you don't want to, but if you want to, you may. Some of you may want to come and just stand. Just be in prayer, saints. Humility. How do I follow the word of God without humility? How do I give him my heart and life and <coughs> surrender my will to his will without humility? How do I... How do I get in the food lines and greet people and love them without humility? Oh, God, forgive me for so many years. I've missed the best part of this church because I was too big. Forgive me, God. Humility. Just stay right there just for a moment if you guys would, would you, while the people come. Just just stand, it's just cool, it's okay. If you need to come, you need to come. You know it. You just, you got them in your head, but you haven't got them totally in your heart. You just hold it on to yourself too much. Just come home. Strange night, isn't it? Whew. It's only half of them up here. You know you need to come. I'm just going to give you a minute more. I'm finished. I don't want to push through. God needs to push through. Someone says, Pastor, you know, you talk people into getting saved. The devil talks you out of getting saved. Why shouldn't I talk you into getting saved? When he stops trying to talk you out of getting saved, I'll stop trying to talk you into getting saved. Stop criticizing. Come on home. Yeah, that's you. Come on. I'll be a fool for you just a little longer. Is that okay? I'll be a fool for you just a little longer. I should quit while I'm ahead. You know why? Because then you'd all think I was wonderful. But this is not about what you think. It's all about what he thinks. So, if you need to come, and I, I know you're there. I can hear the voice of the Lord. Just come. Just stand up and just come. It takes a lot to humble yourself to come. 
takes a lot to humble yourself and come. Humility is bringing you home. The Spirit of grace is calling you home. It takes a lot to get out of yourself and just come. I'm just, I'm seven short of what God spoke. That doesn't mean that seven will respond. It just means there's seven more of you sitting there that need to come. Whether you respond or don't respond is your business. My job is to follow him and be a fool for you, a spectacle. If you need to come, if you need to come, can you imagine what America would be like if we had church services that touch the hearts of the people? I can't make you come. I can't make you come. Well, there's 15 of you. I had faith for 15. God said 22. My question to all of you, what should I do? Would you mind if I just, if we all just stood here just for a minute more so we don't lose anybody? I don't want to see a poor a soul perish. All of you in front, this is my friend, Pastor Joel. He's going to just pray with you over there, give you some free stuff. No weird stuff goes on. Is that okay? You've already humbled yourself enough to come in front of the whole place. You know, God says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you as mine before my Father. There'll be a day when you stand before Jesus and you'll remember this day. He said, when you got out of your chair and came forward, Jesus will stand on your behalf and say, they said it before men, I'll say it before you, Father. He belongs or she belongs to me. Are you sure you don't want to come? Are you sure you don't want to just put yourself aside and get out of this chair and come? So if you guys will just make a left turn and follow Joel right over there, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 15 courageous saints of God. Thank you so much. I know that's uncomfortable to all of us. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord 
and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.